Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Mega Constellation session. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Carl Baker. I'll be the moderator. Um, uh, you know, uh, satellite constellations are really defined by more than one satellite working together as a system. And when you put satellites together as a system, you get increased resiliency, you could, you could get permanent global coverage, and you get uh, unique benefits uh, from that specific to various missions. The idea for satellite constellations has been around for a long time. Uh, geo operators do it. They, they use multiple satellites together to give them resiliency and extra coverage. Uh, United States uh, develop GPS for navigation. That requires a minimum of 24 satellites for that constellation. There's several Earth observation constellations that have tens to hundreds of satellites that are in operation now and, and more on the books coming. But the really big constellations are for communications, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, these, these mega constellations have hundreds, sometimes thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of satellites. And there's, there's several of these mega constellations on, on the books right now. Some of them are being deployed uh, currently. And it's really brought out an unprecedented demand for satellites, for launch vehicles, for satellite hardware, for software. And, and various services that support these big projects. So today we have a group of um, top industry leaders from a, a cross-section of, of the industry that supports these mega constellations. And we're gonna talk about where the industry is going and, and uh, what's, you know, what's happening right now. Uh, so we'll touch on technical solutions, we'll talk about sustainable business models, and uh, also, importantly, we'll talk about how all these systems that are going to come out can, can coexist. So, uh, before we get into our discussion, we'll do a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Carl Baker. I'm a president and founder of Summit Space Corporation. We do technical uh, due diligence to support satellite finance of these uh, big satellite projects. Uh, to date, we've done over $20 billion of deals and uh, our, our two, two biggest, biggest ones are OneWeb and Iridium X. So we've been right in the middle of this big constellation stuff for, for, for quite some time. Uh, I'll, I'll pass it down here to the panel. Uh, you guys would like to introduce yourself? Uh, absolutely, of course. So uh, I'm Andre Binder. So I'm a head of uh, Ruach Space Satellites with the business. Structures, mechanisms, uh, MLI, computers, uh, or technology, navigation solutions, all of that. And uh, we have been on, on uh, uh, for example, you mentioned the Iridium Next. We're preparing and, and developing for coming large translations. And as we speak, we are producing dispensers and uh, structures and uh, thermal solutions for the one web. So uh, that's me. I'm Stephen Israel. I am the CEO of uh, Ariane Space. Uh, so we are a launch service provider. And uh, we are currently deploying uh, one web. And, uh, we are very motivated by the Mega Constellation project with responsibility. My name is Brian Weimer. I'm a partner at Shepard Long, which is a law firm. I work in the Washington, D.C. office. We have about a thousand lawyers around the world, and I lead the space and satellite practice there. I guess all of us work for one web in one way or another. Uh, I met uh, Greg Weiler over a decade ago, and I helped him with his O3B project, and then with one web. Um, I do all the FCC work, the federal communications work for one web. And, but I also represent other satellite operators um, from around the world, including SES, Intel and others. Hello, my name is uh, Eric Stalmer. I'm the Executive Vice President of Voyager Space. Voyager is a, a holding company that has been purchasing uh, space companies uh, and capabilities for the past year and a half now. Uh, prior to COVID, I ran the Commercial Space Flight Federation, which represented a cross-section of organizations in the commercial space industry. Um, and I guess I'm affiliated with one web too in some way or another. Um, so, uh, so I'm happy to be here to talk about some of the regulatory issues that are going to be affecting us. Um, well, thank you for, for having me, and uh, many thanks to IIC for putting this panel together. Uh, if you can guess which one of us is from the West Coast United States tech company, 
um, that would be me. Uh, so Peter Marquez, I head up uh, Space Policy at Amazon Web Services, not to be confused with my brothers and sisters at Amazon.com. I can't help you with packages or any of the rest, but I can help you with space. Um, so uh, I, I have the best toys at Amazon. I get to play with all of our space equipment. Uh, I get the joy of working with other governments around the world uh, and come from a background uh, in U.S. government working policy issues as well as on the private side. Uh, and. Uh, Having a lot of fun in the space business still after this long. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you guys. Uh, really appreciate you being here. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll kick off the discussion here. I, I've got some questions prepared. Maybe we'll just go down the panel uh, and I'll ask everybody a question. And please feel free to jump in. Uh, we're, Ruag is a very innovative company. And thank you for being on the panel here. I personally have experience from some of your hardware on the OneWeb program, I can attest that it did significantly reduce the cost and the manufacturing time of the satellites. Um, could you tell us uh, how uh, the differences that you see between high volume production and, and low volume production and, and where, where the trends are going? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, uh, space will develop along these lines because many of us are coming from the start from the, the low volume. Uh, where it could be institutions who were ordering special satellites, uh, where very much the focus was on risk mitigation rather than, than the pure cost or efficiency in that sense. And I think also for the low volume in, in uh, telecommunications, we have grown into, so to say, accepting a little bit of that type of, of work in a way that the process is key in that sense. But when you come to the mega constellation, then it's another game. Then you, you are going against the spec. There is only one business case to close for the, for the customer. And that means that if you propose something good, that will be accepted. And that means that we are defining much more of the processes in that way. And I think that is also taking us into that uh, also uh, then when you have defined that process and gotten going. And also other customers, uh, also the lower volumes, are, are reaping the effects of that by getting into that. Interesting. So, so I, I think, think uh, the trend here, I think, is very much also about being able to scale in that sense, so to say. Because I think uh, if I see some trend in this, so to say, is that the, the buyers of constellations are seeing that, mm, okay, we need to go for what's best, but also we need to have something that actually works. Because it is a big difference going to a mega constellation. And as a company, we put a lot of our effort in, in not just the pure innovation of it, but also to be able to scale in a reliable way. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, we were very fortunate here to have uh, uh, Stefan with us from Ariane Space. I, I think uh, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that has launched more hardware, tons of hardware in space than Stefan has. Uh, to that end, uh, you know, everybody is concerned about orbital debris, and uh, uh, sustainability of space is very important. Uh, we're, what kind of trends do you see going on, and how do you, uh, how do you, what does our space do for sustainability? It's clear that we must all understand that we are now entering a new period where we will have more and more satellites in lower form. Today, you have 4,500 satellites in operations, two thirds, 80 percent of them are in lower orbit. And tomorrow, if the different uh, constellation materialize, you could have, at the end of this decade, 27,000 satellites. So this is a fact, and space is becoming bigger and bigger. And I think in the industry, it is our job responsibility to make it sustainable. Because we are a space fan, we are absolutely convinced that it is uh, the good news that we can use the lower orbit to better connect uh, uh, human uh, humanity. So we, we are absolutely convinced of this project, but it is clear that they must be compatible with uh, long-lasting sustainability. So on our side, uh, our primary responsibility is not linked to the satellite we launch because it is more the, the responsibility of the, of the, of the operator to make sure that uh, 
for instance, during their lives, they, they, they avoid collisions, that once the satellite is not operational anymore, there is no debris. So it is not primary our responsibility. As a rocket, our responsibility is to, to leave a space clean after our activity. And you know that there is a law in France, which is called the uh, space law operations, and we will have the obligation to deorbit the upper stage of Ariane. It means that the upper stage of Ariane will not last uh, four years uh, 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 in space, and we will have to deorbit it. But more broadly, and to go beyond our direct area of responsibility, we must collectively make sure that in this context of uh, low orbit uh, high activity, space remains accessible. What is its space avoids collision, and once the satellites have done their job, uh, they, they leave a clean space. And uh, maybe we could speak about regulation, what is a good regulation for that, uh, at which level, and we have also the topic, I do not want to be too long, of frequencies, because we know as well that frequencies are a limited asset, so we must make sure that we have a good cohabitation of different project law of orbit. And we must absolutely avoid a sort of de facto monopolization by one player. So this is a message I want to, to, to share very strongly, because I think uh, it would be a catastrophe for space if one player was over monopolizing the space with risk collisions and eviction of other people. That's a, that's a really great point. Uh, okay, so I'll move on here to uh, Brian. We're very lucky. Uh, you know, Shepard Mullen is, is one of the top space law firms in the world, and Brian is their top uh, space law expert. And so uh, we've got him here on our panel. We've got to really leverage that and, and ask him as many things as we can. I guess, uh, Brian, you know, could you comment on the regulatory environment around orbital debris and, and maybe also if you have time mark access and uh, spectrum rights also? Sure. Thanks, Carl. And I'll just say stuff you've already covered two of my three points. So, so excellent. No, this is perfect. It's, uh, you don't have to be a lawyer to, to state the obvious. It's, it's, it's clear what needs to be done. So I think I, I've identified three things, I think, from a regulatory perspective. Remember, I, I practice law in the United States at the Federal Communications Commission, so I know how we do things in the United States. I don't really know how things operate in France. But I certainly see the interaction between laws in the United States and the way that they relate out to the International Telecommunications Union and other countries. And so when I look at what you're calling mega constellations, large constellations, I think there's three things that I see. The first two you mentioned, one is mobile debris, right? The next is spectrum. And then the final one is what I call market access slash ITU. But to talk for a second about orbital debris, the FCC is just one jurisdiction. But the FCC in the United States has certain rules about orbital debris, and these are hotly debated right now. For example, should debris or should satellites be deorbited after five years or 25 years or 10 years? What is the, what is a good lifetime to give a satellite up in space? Many people say it should be five years. Some people say it should be 25. The current rule of the FCC is 25, but that's been hotly debated, right? And I don't know the answer to that. I think engineers and and policy people have to figure out the answer to that question, but that's just one issue that needs to be addressed. Another would be, um, what about whether satellites in space have to have propulsion? Many satellites don't, right? If you require a propulsion, though, then suddenly the CubeSats of the world may not exist, right? Because so many of them are being launched right now. They don't have propulsion. Do we want to kill that industry? No, we don't. Um, but that's another topic that's been hotly debated in the United States. And I think, as a space lawyer, I, I do think countries around the world, whether it's through the IT or some other means, um, need to grapple with these issues. Because right now, I certainly at the United States, with SpaceX launching so many satellites, right? They're approaching 2,000 now, I think, in space, and launching 120 a month. So they're you know, sort of dwarfing everybody else really quickly. And so we're going to have, it's not a law of the jungle, but I mean, they're going to occupy a lot of space, right? And they're going to dictate what some of these rules are, I think just by operation the size of their constellation. Um, so 
overplay is a hot issue. I don't have the answers, um, but I think it's something that certainly the world needs to think about, and the FCC in the United States is, is actively thinking about this, certainly. I'll talk for just a second about spectrum. Um, my advice to the industry, because I'm seeing what's happening in the United States, is that right now I'm working for SES on what we call the CNN proceeding in the United States. So terrestrial wireless interests in the United States are extremely effective. Why? Because the CNN spectrum, which has been taken away now from satellite companies, was auctioned for just over $80 billion. $80 billion. That goes a long way uh, in Congress in the United States toward paying off deficits. It, it, it just catches their attention. So any time the terrestrial wireless industry comes to Congress and they say, we'd like you to auction some spectrum, and the satellite operators stand up and say, hold on a second, we're using it, it just, it's not a very uh, um, fair conversation, right? Because we cannot auction spectrum for satellite um, except for domestic satellite in the United States. So we see that. There's another proceeding that's, that uh, actually Charlie Ergen and Dish and Michael Dell in the United States are trying to launch, which is essentially to convert the KU band spectrum, 12 gigahertz, to terrestrial wireless. That is something that I would watch closely right now. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. But um, this is only you know, just one country, of course, all around the world. We've seen CBAN disappear in countries around the world. You know, what's going to happen to the KU band and other spectrum resources that are just absolutely necessary for satellite companies? So that's, that's a battle that's going to happen around the world, I think, that, that the industry needs to focus on. But I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Carl. My, OK, I'll keep going. Uh, the third point is market access. And so, again, I practice law in the United States. What I see in the United States is um, essentially in the United States, when it comes to the, the, the fight between SpaceX and OneWeb, which is what we call the first processing round of the KU band, the FCC has taken an exception to IT priority when it comes to using spectrum within the borders of the United States. So even though OneWeb has a higher IT priority than SpaceX, the two companies are required by law to share the spectrum in the United States, which, when you have 2,000 satellites from SpaceX, already 350 from OneWeb, going up to about 650, we can imagine that there are going to be instances of potential you know, uh, collision of frequencies, not physical collision, but you know, with both companies want to use the spectrum at the same time. In those instances, the FCC has said the two companies have to split the spectrum in half. 50-50. If there are three companies, you just get one third for that moment in time. My point is, IT priority doesn't matter in the United States. And I wonder what the effect is when you go around the world and you want to get market access. If you're one over your SpaceX, you want to provide service in Nigeria, or you want to provide service in Kazakhstan. And people are going to watch the United States, what happened there. Well, IT priority didn't really matter there. Should we follow that regime? And I can tell you um, that there are some forces within the United States who are trying to export that concept to other jurisdictions where we say IT priority doesn't matter. And that's a big shift, I think, in what's happening in the regulatory world. So I'll turn it back to you. Wow, sounds a little messy and scary. Uh, we wouldn't want to lose KU band in the satellite business. That's the best frequency. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's uh, scary. Okay, so moving on to Eric. Uh, with Voyager. Voyager is a really exciting and interesting company. Uh, you invest in space companies. You also offer services. Could you tell us a little bit about your company? What kind of companies you're looking to buy? What, what kind of services you're selling in the French you see? Yeah, so, uh, so it is. It's been very exciting. It, part of it is if you could start a brand new space company and do whatever you want to do in the space industry, what would you do? What capabilities would you have? First off, I would hire a good spectrum attorney. So <laughs> if anyone needs a good spectrum attorney, he's right here. Um, but, but, you know, as we talk about mega constellations, uh, this week we're talking about a mono constellation. You know, we, we made an announcement that we partnered with uh, one of our companies, Nanorax and Lockheed Martin, to build a commercial space station. So that was the goal, and uh, something that we felt we had core capability with, with Nanorax to do, to do that. Um, we're also very interested in on-orbit servicing and, and active debris removal. Uh, we think that's critical. You know, sustainability, as Stefan has said, um, sustainability is, is, it should be everyone's concern, and, and it should be a priority for everyone. Uh, and we want to see that you know, in our core competencies as, you know, moving forward and, and how do we integrate those capabilities amongst our, our vertical companies and how do we you know, horizontally bring them all together. Um, 
and of course the, the moon is of interest and we, we look uh, not just on, on lunar extraction of the moon and how the, the resources will be applied to the moon, but you know, eventually there'll be constellations around the moon and we think that's a, a pretty exciting idea, uh, especially some of the communications constellations that are, are being discussed. So it certainly is an exciting time. There's a lot of money uh, in the space industry right now uh, and, and how you, you apply that capital and where it's going. Um, I think we'll get into this a little later today, but you know, there's smart capital and then and I think there's just people that don't like their money and, and they're, uh, they're investing in some crazy things, I would say. Um, but, uh, but it is interesting to see uh, the, the growth and, and the influx of, of private capital into the market and in a order of magnitude that we've never seen. You know, 2020, I, I think the latest number I saw was $5.6 billion that was, was put into the uh, just commercial uh, marketplace and entirely. So um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for a lot of people and, and we're, we're keeping our eyes open and, and we think there's some great companies out there that we'd like to, to bring on to the Voyager family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, this small company down at the end here, uh, Peter, uh, thank you so much for being here with Amazon Web Service. Uh, you, you guys touch about every aspect of the satellite constellation business. Uh, we're just curious uh, about how your business is going, where you see the trends, um, are you offering any new services? It is, well, thank you for that. Um, so there, there's a lot we're doing. Uh, the interesting part to me is that Amazon has been doing things in space for quite a long time. I didn't know about it, and then when I got hired over a year ago, it was part of a whole establishment of a new space vertical within AWS. So now we have a specific group dealing with space topics. Um, and essentially, I mean, all space has been since the beginning is, is about data, and that's the business that AWS is in, whether that is Earth observation, it's navigation, it's communication, even science, you know, data collection, it's all about moving data and making data say things and interpret it. And, and that's the business that we're in is helping our customers make the best use of the data. So um, some real quick examples, I mean, we're here in, in Dubai, uh, AWS supports the Hope mission on Mars. So we do, we help them with the analysis of their images. We take, um, uh, within 20 minutes, we're able to actually help them analyze the data and get it to their scientists in what would have taken 48 hours before. Um, we are working with JPL on Perseverance. We host all their images and all their data, um, even down to things that are as important as saving lives. So we work with a company, one of our customers is a company called Fireball. They changed their name to XC that does um, uh, uh, rush fire detection. And using AWS services, they're actually, they've gotten to a point using machine learning that they can, they have zero error rate on detection of fires. And then using other automation tools, they can go from the point of detecting an image or detecting smoke to notifying first responders in three minutes. Um, so it's really, I'm having a lot of fun because we're doing things that I think are really impressive with really impressive space companies and some of the companies that Eric's talking about coming up in the space community. So it's been a really fun time uh, to see what's happening in the space community and with the mega constellations and what that represents for Again, data, what, what can we do with this data and what new ideas are going to spring up that we haven't even thought of is really exciting to me. And so there, the other part of me, the, the policy side of me, really wants to get into the other discussion about the regulations and sustainability and all the rest. So hopefully we'll get to that point because there's a lot of things that I think um, from a personal standpoint in my background I'd love to get into and also from an AWS standpoint we talk about sustainability and talk about transparency and all these other activities that we're going to need as we do this. I think there's a role for industry to play in addition to government. When you work with these small companies, do they bring you in as part of the team? Do you, do you really uh, do you help them develop their service? Yeah, so we do a little bit of both, right? So, so um, often companies will come to us and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this and, you know, it'll It'll cost five dollars to scale at a global level. Uh, you know, to, to do so. so they're able to actually just take two smart people in a room with a good idea, and now they have a global capability. The other thing we do is we have a venture capital and startup arm that works with the startup companies to help get them educated on how to use data and how to, how to use cloud services. 
you know, so, so we'll work with venture capital and startup funds, you know, like a wage or somebody else to help their their portfolio companies learn how to do these things and scale and use data and machine learning and AI and security and all the rest to get moving uh, at, at a global level. Cool, cool. Um, okay, uh, do another round of questions here. Um, Anders, uh, what kind of uh, new technologies is, is Rulog bringing forward? Actually, when we talk about mega, okay, we do a lot of cool things like high processing computers and processors and, and high automated production of, of web structures and things. But talk about the mega constellation and, and uh, how to make that success, I think it's, it's much more about the, the, the grinding of industrializing things. I think that is the future of this and standardizing things and being more industrial. To be honest, I think that we in the space industry, if you look at building mega constellation, of course, we do our science missions, that's super cool, we all love it here. But maybe sometimes we're a little bit too much in love with our traditional space history. And yeah, thank, you, thank you, by the way. That's, I could not agree more. No, okay, okay, so, and sorry, Stefan, not everything about rocket science is rocket science anymore. <laughs> so, so, and I think this is what we have to get to. And, uh, and, and you, you can, can see, see what have happened in mobile telephony and all these things. things. I mean, companies, companies actually, actually went together. They took the risk to standardize, standardize together. together. That's, That's a bit scary, because standardization, that leads to consolidation, and some was kicked out. But, but if we were to maximize what we got as bang for the buck when we were invested in consolidation, we would do much more standardization and be much tougher on ourselves, so to say, and take those type of risks. At least that's my thought, so to say. I think that's what we need if we're going to look into the future, so to say. I don't know what the rest of you say. I take that as a, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good concept, I guess, but uh, it's hard to standardize satellites, you know? Yeah, yeah I know way it is, but I mean, there are many ports inside the satellites that you could go down to when you come to interfaces and, and data interfaces and how you do buses and communicate, just such things, so to say. Uh, I think there's so much you can actually standardize more, but, but someone has to start in a way. And, and here I think that where I started from, where, where we're doing institutional business, there's still an acceptance for doing things in that way. But here, the constellations might be the, the, the change driver in this one, and, and, uh, but there is more to, I can promise you, there is more to do than, than you know. Yeah, 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 it's a good point, a good point. One uh, development uh, problem might be worth mentioning is one of, of course, created the factory, right, with, with the Airbus. Now, look, it's not standardization for everybody, but when you're making that many satellites, right, they invested in the factory so that it was automated. And I think that historically, satellites were built one at a time, right? And so this is their cranking out you know, two or three a week. I don't know how many SpaceX is making per week, but they're launching so many, so many must have standardized that process internally. So that's, again, sort of a, an inflection point in the industry where you're manufacturing massive numbers of satellites really quickly. And that's a great example, and uh, if you look at like the core industry, if you go to a core plant these days, all of the big suppliers are located, actually, next to it. Uh, we are located for our structures next, next to, to uh, Airbus One Web there, so to say. So it's, it's one good step, so to say, but I think right. there could be many more. It's at the beginning, but it's happening. Yes, uh, I really agree. I mean, what is really changing with the constellation is the fact that uh, it makes our industry entering in standardization, big volumes, big cadences. You know, uh, for years, uh, the number of uh, commercial launches were very, uh, was very limited in space. We, we were uh, trying to capture 20 to 25 GTO satellites, telecom satellites, between two or three launch service providers. This was the reality of the business in the nine, in, uh, from 1990 to uh, 2010. And uh, this decade, the change has happened, and we have really changed the dimension. For instance, for OneWeb, uh, Iron Space has signed a contract for 19 launchers, like that. Boom, 19. Uh, in the future, I am sure that we are going to discuss about more volumes. So, what does it change for us? Clearly, the, the necessity to benefit from this higher cadence and to be able to launch uh, as much as possible. I must, it's not the only point. We must have launchers which are fully adapted to what the constellation are requiring. 
they are requiring a lot of performance because it's much more economic to go in a big launcher than in a mini launcher when you have a mega constellation. I say that because I see a confusion. People are telling you small launcher requires small, uh, small satellite requires small launcher. Not at all. When you go for mega constellation project, you want big, big, big launcher. So you need to have launcher which are capable. You need to have launchers which are able to make more complex missions in space. And regarding Ariane 6, we have now a reinitable upper stage, which will help us a lot for constellation. You need to be available as much as possible. And uh, between Ariane 6 and Ariane 5, we are going to reduce by a factor three the time of our campaign. So it is really a game changer for the industry, game changer due to higher cadence, but also to have products which are, uh, uh, which are um, uh, adapted to constellation. And having uh, our dear rag close to me, I must say that we will have a bigger fairing with more volume under the fairing. And this is why, and uh, Ariane 6 is very adapted to deploy mega constellation. And to be honest, even much more than what we imagined uh, five or six years ago. When, when we designed the launcher, we had, we had in mind the GTO market. And, and what we see is that this launcher we we'll have to work fully more and more for mega constellation. What is the big innovation on Ariane 6 that gives it the extra capacity? But this is uh, uh, the fact that uh, we will have uh, a performance which is at least the same as Ariane 5. And you know that with Ariane 5, we have written a record uh, three days ago by injecting, it was in a geostationary orbit, 10 tons point two, uh, 63 kilo, which has never been done before, so we have a very capable launcher. The second point, we have more volume under the fairing. If we were to make a mission with the current design of one web satellite, we could accommodate 78 one web satellites, as opposed to 35 in the Soyuz, and by the way, we are very happy with what we do with Soyuz, but you, you see how capable is, uh, is the rocket. Uh, you have the reinitable upper stage, which will allow us to make, uh, to make more complex missions. And again, the duration of a campaign uh, on Ariane 5 is 30 days, a launch campaign, it will be 9 days on Ariane 6. And Ariane 6 will be capable to be launched every 15 days, as opposed to Ariane 5, which was approximately one month. So, all the, the machinery, if you want, is uh, adapted to this uh, huge turn in the market. Exciting. It's going to be exciting to see that come out. Wow. Uh, Brian, um, uh, Moon on you. Um, how do you see convergence uh, between mobile networks and, and space ne networks playing out? You seem to be right in the middle of all this. Uh, I'm mostly seeing fights between two because I, I'm, I'm a spectrum lawyer, right? right? So the, the, yeah, the terrestrial wireless folks are largely um, trying to take spectrum away from the satellite industry for the most part. From a business perspective, however, um, I guess what I would say is, you know, I represented a company, one of my first satellite companies in the 1990s, um, conceived of something called mobile satellite service with an ancillary terrestrial component, right? MSS, ATC, we've talked about that for a long time. The idea was you take your cell phone, in the city, you know, on the terrestrial network, and you go out to the country, automatically flip over to the satellite. It's a great concept, right? And actually, then Terrastar brought that forward. They tried to do it. They went into practice. It didn't work. And now, though, we're, again, the industry keeps changing, and things are actually happening. Things we've talked about for a long time that didn't happen in the past, like a teledesic or a big constellation, that are happening now, right? And so uh, we have seen, for example, one where that, um, has a contract with at and right? And it's, it's not, not going to necessarily be MSS ATC, where you're going to have the same handset flipping over automatically into a satellite. But there, there is absolutely a role uh, for the satellite constellation to provide backhaul in remote areas and things like that. So they, one of the things that is extending the network, for example. So I think there's a lot more deals to be had. <laughs> but what I mostly see is, is, the, is sort of the fight over spectrum. Who's going to get access to spectrum? Who's going to pay for it? Wow, that's scary. I thought, you know, for, for my whole career, I've always dreamed of this con idea of convergence. And, and well, people have talked about it off and on, more and off, more and more. And now we're seeing this. <laughs> well, well, I mean, so I guess to, to, to put a positive spin on it, and this is something to think about, again, I don't know what's happening in every country around the world, I'll tell you what's happening in the United States. 
uh, when it comes to the C band, right, it, it's not all loss because the satellite companies, there are five major satellite operators that have C band services in the United States, right? And those companies agreed to give up their spectrum, not all of it, but a large portion of it. And the FCC took it, converted it to trusted wireless, Verizon and AT&T and others paid about $85 billion for it in the, in the auction. But the satellite operators, there's a pot of money of about $10 billion that's going to get divided among the satellite operators if they exit the spectrum quickly. In other countries, satellite operators didn't get anything. So if you are a satellite operator and your country is considering conversion of some spectrum, you know, take a look at what the FCC has done. There's at least something for the satellite operators, an incentive to clear the spectrum quickly, make it available, because unfortunately, Verizon and AT&T, they have a license. It's like a piece of real estate. They're the only ones who can use that spectrum in that area. So they can take it to the bank, and then they can get a loan, they can use it as security. Satellite spectrum is different. All the satellite companies are using the exact same spectrum. They have to share it. So they can't just take it to the bank and say, I'd like to take a, a loan against this. It's not something that's as freely assignable. And so consequently, that's why it's harder for them to just sell the spectrum. So anyway, as other satellite or as other countries think about whether they're going to convert some satellite spectrum to terrestrial, the satellite industry should keep in mind that there are ways to monetize that um, that are not just a pure outright sale. Uh, okay, Eric, uh, moving on to you. Um, special Purpose Acquisition Corporations. Uh, that's a hot topic in the investment world right now. Uh, could you comment on it? What do you, what do you think about SPACs? I've never, never heard of them. them. <laughs> oh, SPACs. SPACs, yes. Um, I, I think it's fascinating. Um, and I think um, if you... Called the, the, the Wizard of Oz, you know, they, they define that there's good witches and there's bad witches. Uh, and, and I think they're, they're the same goes for SPACs. I think there's, there's good SPACs that are timely and um, purposeful and, you know, uh, serve to what the client uh, needs right now at, at that time. And I think there's some, some bad SPACs out there. Uh, and, and I think the I, I, I say with a high level certitude that when the, for, for our perspective, you, you caveat, you know, the U.S. government, I think when the administration and, and Congress, when the dust settles on all our budgetary issues uh, and, you know, the midterm elections, I think we're going to see uh, a higher degree of scrutiny looking at some of these special purpose, uh, these facts. Um, it's, it's interesting how easy the process is, and full full disclosure, Voyager is looking to go public, but we're doing it through the, the traditional S1 process, um, probably through NASDAQ uh, is, is what we're envisioning. And it's a long, tedious process. Um, we, we are sending several lawyers' children to school, uh, to college, um, for, for some of the fees that we're paying, as well as the bankers. But, you know, I, we're, we're in it for the long haul. And, and I do believe there are companies that are in it for the long haul. Um, but I also feel for some of these companies, it, it's the last resort of, of financing. And, and I scratch my head, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a simple person, you know, uh, with somewhat conservative financial views, that, you know, some of these companies that have zero revenue and zero revenue forecasts, you know, in, in the near term, and how they can get, you know, a $2 billion valuation um, and, and the projections that they have is this remarkable hockey stick that everyone seems to have that you can go from zero revenue to $5 billion in revenue overnight. Um, and yet, yet it's not the fault of you know, the, uh, these companies all the time. I think it's the fault of some of these investors and these bankers that have seen these companies as a quick ATM for the cash with, you know, withdrawal from, from the, the process. And, and I see that, I think you see that in some of the redemption rates uh, of these companies that, you know, the shareholders pull out up to 50, 60, sometimes 80, 85% on one, one, for one instance, that they take the money out right away. And, and so that worries me. We're, as a space person who uh, I've been doing this for 25 years, where I think, and I think I speak for almost everyone in this room, that, you know, uh, 
the, the beauty of our industry and growing our industry and the desires that we have for you know, humanity as a whole, you know, going you know, through exploration and all that stuff. But there's also a business element of it. And all of a sudden, you know, I think the business community got clued in and say, hey, we can stick rich on this. You know, I think there's a market here. Um, so it's, I, I find it very interesting. I think um, the, the next chapter hasn't been written yet, but the chapter could start uh, at 11 you know, in some cases. So, um, so we'll see. It remains to be seen. And why did you uh, choose the traditional route and not, not go the quick SPAC way? Well, I, and again, this is, this is not a, um, you know, a front on any of this the SPACs. There was a lot of great offers that came in. I think for, for the, the, the purpose that, uh, that Voyager saw on how we were going to grow the company um, and the, the, the interest that we were going to have, it just seemed to be better, more prudent for us you know, to go the, the traditional S1 route. Um, I think there was time was on our, our side. We didn't need to raise this kind of capital immediately. And there's, there's companies out there that don't need to raise the capital either, and yet they're going because I think they're looking for that exit. A lot of people are looking for that, the exit. And, and it's a success. I mean, look at how many, how many um, space exits there were prior to 2020. There was very, very few. And this year alone, in 2020, 2021, I think we've had, a, a, I can think of 14 off the top of my head. So, um, so it's happening, and that's a good thing for the industry. And again, the, the capital coming into the industry. But um, I, I think there should be a level of caution for, for some of the companies uh, as they move forward. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Peter, um, what kind of new services are you, are you bringing out? Um, can you tell us about your strategy going forward? Anything you can disclose? Uh, sure. I, I've left NDAs at the back of the room for everybody to sign. Uh, let me tell you about the new Alexa device. Um, we got to ask. You know. <laughs> Good try. Um, so, so, I mean, there, there, there are things that are public. Uh, we have a system called Ground Station, uh, which does uh, command and control and, and data link for, uh, for satellites. So a way for us to get the data immediately into the cloud and allow our customers to warehouse and analyze the data as quickly as possible. Um, we're doing everything from uh, digital engineering to architecture work with customers, uh, all the way, you know, essentially the whole life cycle of space operations, supply chain um, management, cybersecurity operations, everything in there. Um, we're working with customers to do that. I think the, this may get lost on some of our international crowd, but there was, a, there was an old commercial in the United States where the, the, uh, the company BASF that used to, the, the line was, we don't make a lot of the things you use, we make them better. And I think that's a lot of what AWS is doing with a lot of the space companies is we're working with space companies to help enhance their products that they in turn use for agriculture or navigation or communication. And that's really been the fun part for me, having spent a long time in government and almost every day was pugilistic. Um, you know, you talk about convergence. The convergence I dealt with usually was, was fist to face uh, dealing, dealing inside of government. So for me, the, the Fun part for me is actually getting to work with a variety of companies, helping them do new things and seeing innovation and, and talking about you know the, the companies that, that Eric's seen uh, coming up uh, around around the world um, and, and helping them has really been the exciting part for me. Uh, and again, having been doing this for 20 years, it's, it's, it keeps you fresh to see new people with new ideas and what they're doing for space. So I'm really enjoying it. Um, so I, you don't just sign the NDAs. You don't just see them. Part of the team, you're part, part of the business. business. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so we we see ourselves as a, as a as a useful enabler to a lot of these companies and what they're trying to do. You know, the 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 percentage at AWS is ninety percent of what we build um, is is built on customer requests saying, hey, we need a tool that does this, we need a solution that does this. The other ten percent is us sort of divining and reading between the lines, using experience, saying. They just ask for this. The next step is to ask for this. And so we often just say, okay, well, we just developed this for you. How will you use that? And again, coming from the government side and working in national security space, some of the things we would do is, okay, we got the 90% solution of what this capability can do. Let's put it in the field and see what the people in uniform can do with it. You would find that they could do things with it you had no concept of when you were acquiring the system. And then it's been the fun part for me is, 
getting the capabilities out and seeing what people can do with it. So when we talk about mega constellations, seeing what that can do for global connectivity and what that can do for just humanity and quality of life for everybody, that's some really exciting, exciting things. My concern is, you know, going back to what, what Brian and others said, which is how are we going to make this all work and make it work in a way that is, is equitable, gives everybody a fair chance to, to use capability, to bring capabilities to market, and, uh, and that's the part I'm very interested in seeing how we get to, to get to. And at least from, from the AWS side, we'll continue to provide the data and make sure there's clarity in what we're doing in space and transparency and uh, to help our customers. But there's still a lot more that I think we can do on the regulatory side. Um, at, at the risk of going long, I think there's, there's a lesson maybe going back Maybe going back to the 1500s that we can learn here. So Sir Thomas Gresham, if anybody knows Gresham's Law, Gresham's Law essentially says bad money, devalued money, will push out good money. And my concern in, in mega constellations and just regulation in general is that it's very easy to set up a regulatory environment that makes it easy to do business. But is that, right the, environment? Is that the right environment for sustainable business? Are you going to set up bad regulatory regimes, and bad is a, is a subjective term, and is that going to create an environment where we all can't benefit from, from space? Uh, and, and the other part, too, is, again, having worked in government, the pace of regulation is at a certain pace. The pace of industry and innovation is much, much faster. So one of my concerns is, are we going to break this legacy system that we have of government being the key holder for regulations, but now we're outpacing with all the innovation that's happening? How do you get a regulatory structure and a global understanding of what is sustainable and useful, uh, how, to, how to sustainably use space, and a global understanding of that that also matches the pace of innovation? That's going to be a really difficult thing to do. It's going to require a lot of countries to come together and a lot of companies to come together and talk about how we do this in a, in a transparent and sustainable way. Um, it's, unfortunately, I don't have the right answers. I, I'm sure if I put Brian under a retainer, he would tell me what those answers are. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting times, um, but it's, I do believe there's, there are solutions out there. It's going to be an industry working with governments to figure it out. Brian, you, you know, according to you, it's going the other way. So, so I guess I would, not to make it more complicated, but frankly it is, because the other element to it is that there's an national security implication of everything you do in space, right? And so there's a race among all the countries to be first to occupy space and to dominate space because it impacts national security, right? So the United States, while sustainability is certainly an issue, I would say probably the people who make those decisions, whether it's the former administration or the current one, are thinking probably number one about national security. So if you have a choice between promoting your satellite company to occupy space, right, even putting at risk the environment, well, another country that you might be you know, concerned about is also trying to race you into space, what are you going to do? Right? I'm not saying that, I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but that's another element of it. It's absolutely an element of it. And I can say in the United States, when SpaceX launches this many satellites, there are a lot of people cheering. Um, and a lot of those are in the Department of Defense. Uh, I understand. I mean, even, even, even forgetting the national, I mean, depends on how you define national security, right? I mean, economics and trade is definitely a sure. element of national power. Yeah. And that's why I brought up question of laws. Is, we want to avoid this race to the bad money, right? The, and having the bad regulations and bad environments push out what could be a good environment. So I'm in complete agreement that this is this is a, a, a difficult problem, but it's also potentially a very good opportunity to, to think about things in a, in a different way than we have before. Right. So I think the other theme that I would mention on that is, you know, if you've ever been in a dispute before the ITU, and I have been there. <laughs> If you go to the International Telecommunications Union and ask them to resolve your dispute, there are no judges there. There's nobody to decide things for you. It's really just nations, right? Each of them have their own sovereign right to have access to space, whether you're Papua New Guinea or Rwanda, right? Everybody has the same equal right. And um, you can't turn to them to resolve your dispute. It's a diplomatic issue, basically, at a certain point. And so, in the United States, of course, we have decisions, and if there's a dispute, you can take it to a court, and you will actually get a decision at some point. The yeah, IT doesn't work that way. So I, I, that's why I say, I don't know, maybe the industry has to be the one to take the lead because we can't turn to the ITU to solve this problem because the ITU is simply a collection of countries around the world 
all of them might disagree, and neither one can tell the other what to do. So the industry might be the one who has to lead the way out of this problem. But I have a background in, in telecom, and I think uh, I'm picking up what you said, because what really created the, the system we have today was in when the GSM system was created, in an alliance between operators and governments and, and, and the industry. Right. That was actually the way to, to get it done in a way. It's not as simple in space, I know that, but, but uh, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe we have a role to play in that. I think it's, um, it's a, a mix of uh, what uh, the industry can bring as a, a code of uh, best practices uh, and uh, regulation we can promote. And for sure, we have here a responsibility because, again, what we must avoid by any means is to go to joint space. I mean, we cannot afford to do in space what from time to time has been done on Earth. It's simply impossible. So we, and we must show our commitment to uh, what I would call uh, the young generation. If the space community is not seeing to the young engineers who want to join us, we are responsible of a sustainable space. We will be under criticism, so this is for me absolutely clear. But after, and it's not easy, uh, and you have touched the point, we, we need international regulation, I think. And uh, I have seen that uh, there has been, at the last G7, a declaration on sustainable space. So here again, uh, uh, I don't, you, you do not uh, imagine such a declaration 10 years ago. So it is more and more uh, an issue. Uh, and for sure, from a way or another, it will have to be tackled also by the governments. And what you say is exactly true. You have the FCC on one side, you have the ICO on the other side. Not very clear to understand uh, from an industry point of view how it match, if it matches, and uh, what are the needs. Uh, the ICO is taking what is uh, given by the different nations and has uh, here a limited power. But uh, I think it's a good uh, it's a good topic for G7 for uh, regional organizations such as Europe. Uh, industry must come with the best practices, and after we need uh, a good international regulation. It's interesting, you know, we have commercial space, and we're doing more and more with it all the time. We're, we're using it more and more. We've got more and more data we've got to push, and it's stressing more and more satellites and it's stressing the, the framework and, the, and, and, and the, everything that's supporting that, you know. Uh, so we've got some challenges to, to get through moving forward. Um, okay, I guess uh, uh, I've got one more round of questions if we want to go through. Uh, Anders, um, uh, how, how has this uh, mega constellation uh, business impacted company and in, in your future plans? Yeah, I mean, Mega Constellation have uh, two, two significant qualities. They are large and they are late, typically. So, so it's not easy to be planning around it, but I, I think uh, the main thing about this is that it's, it's actually, to be a bit serious, I think it's very dangerous to build your company around Mega Constellation because it's so hard to plan. I think uh, the future in, in supplying Mega Constellation is for those who can scale up. You, you, you can't live by them, and they, they go over time, etc. So they are big, but they is not everything for you. That's at least how we tackle it. So we love them, we want to be part of them, we invest to be them, but we're not building our future on them. That's, that's our take. It is up, it is up. Well, here's the guy who's doing it. Uh, Stefan, 11 out of 19 launches, and you're just knocking them down almost a month at a time now. It's very impressive. Yes, if you should see what we are delivering this year, one web will represent uh, more than 50% uh, of our launches and even more. So, uh, and next year it could be the same story. So, uh, we see how it changes our industry. But what I concur with uh, what uh, Anders has said, we need also the geostationary orbit. And uh, this uh, orbit uh, is not dead. There are many, many projects which are relying on GTO. We see. Uh, uh, that it's uh, also uh, coming back. But it is true that if you make some market assessment, what we consider today as accessible market, the, the mega constellation market in value could represent four times the geostationary accessible market. So uh, we need to take that into account, but uh, we like all our bits, EO, MEO, and GEO, so with no discrimination, but uh, it seems that there are high volumes there. 
but I agree we should not be dependent only on this project, even though they would be absolutely key for the future. Interesting. Uh, Brian, uh, uh, to get, we got a couple more minutes here. Uh, you know, we really didn't touch too much on the interference issue between constellations. I, I understand that issue myself, and it's very, very difficult to work through. Uh, what are you doing on that? Do you, do you work on that at all? Yes, yes, as I mentioned, um, so take the OneWeb and SpaceX, remember, the commission, the FCC came up with this rule that if the two companies have what they call an inline interference event, which is to say you know, two satellites between a station, uh, one, both want to point to an earth station on the ground, they're going to interfere with each other. Um, the FCC got the rule, avoidance of inline interference events. So at every moment in time, theoretically, where SpaceX and OneWeb or other companies are using the same spectrum at the same time, they have to use a computer model, I presume, and somehow divide the spectrum in half. That's the rule, actually. And I'm not sure it's something that they can be implemented in practice. Nobody's had to ever do it. It's a theoretical rule in the books. Um, so radio frequency interference is a uh, issue I think we're going to see potentially right around the corner. Historically, right, this is what the IT coordination process was all about. Satellite companies would get together in a room, figure out how to operate, and then avoid interference to one another. It's going to get much more complicated. Um, and I don't think we're there yet because SpaceX, well, they have 2,000 satellites, one about 350. Uh, one of us isn't really starting their commercial service until the end of this year. And SpaceX is just getting started as well. So maybe 2022, the topic of discussion will be does the these, uh, avoidance of inline independence rule actually work in practice? We don't really know yet. So I think it's, it's a big issue for sure. I know everyone has their own computer model for this interference issue, but which model are you talking about? I don't know, we have to talk to the engineers about that one. <laughs> okay, okay. It's, it's, it's very confusing, yeah. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Eric, what, what kind of uh, companies are you looking for in the future? Can you talk about that at all, or, or uh, is it secret? Uh, not launch companies. Uh, <laughs> Rest assured, Stefan, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> No, no I, I, I say that because, uh, you know, it, it just seems, you know, a lot of focus and a lot of attention are on a lot of these new launch providers. And when I say new, that's the one we talk, the, the companies that we talk about that we know they're coming online in, inevitably. Um, but at last count, you know, I, I thought I heard there was 160 launch companies in development. And, and then you look at the numbers, you know, if there's going to be 30,000 launches, um, over the next 10 years or so, uh, just a number there. Uh, as, as, as you said, um, Ariane Space, they're hitting their cadence. They're, they're only going to increase their cadence. SpaceX, you know, they're, they're, they're doing, you know, uh, they, they got a, a decent size of the market, as well as the inter other international launch providers. So, and as Stefan said, you know, where these larger launch providers are providing, you know, much greater capability, you know, much more capacity in the launch, it becomes for the smaller launch companies a much, I dare say, smaller niche market to provide, um, and is the cost going to be there? And, and I think as we're seeing the cost of launch come down, um, I think that that's opening up greater opportunities for these these different um, different types of uh, companies, you know, whether it be small sats or a, you know a communication or remote sensing or earth observation. Whatever it may be, I think that's where the opportunity is. As the costs come down, they're able to invest more revenue into that kind of research and development. As we see the, the miniaturization come down, and, and maybe you know, in light of these these large constellations going into you know these uh, you know the orbit that they can get to, you know, in space propulsion, I think is going to take on a greater role. And I, and I think there's there's a lot of exciting companies out there that you know have these propulsion systems that are are going to help you know enable these larger constellations as, as we look forward. So, um, yeah, yeah I, 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 I shouldn't say, I, I said what well, we're not looking at, but there, there's, a, there's a lot of other, you know, capabilities that, you know, we're hearing, and, and especially as, as Peter said, you know, these, these new startup companies enable a lot of uh, opportunity for growth, and, and thanks again to the, the, the existing launch providers that are, are bringing down the cost of access to space. Right, right. Cool. Uh, Peter, uh, we're almost out of time, but uh, can you comment about Kuiper at all? Uh, maybe it, uh, anything, information about them, and, and if not, uh, are you interacting with them in a special way? 
We have 40, 40 seconds left. <laughs> we have 35 seconds left. So for those of you that, that don't, it's not really transparent to the outside world, uh, Kuiper is essentially, they're, they're my brothers and sisters in the other part of Amazon. So AWS, where all the web services are, Amazon Web Services, um, that's, that's all aerospace and satellite. Kuiper is actually in the devices team. So your Kindle, your Echo devices, your Alexa is where Kuiper is. So, um, but again, there's obviously discussions with the Kuiper team because we have to stay synchronized on regulatory issues and you know filings with the FCC and the rest and making sure we're, we're tied up and up there. So the Kuiper team is doing, doing great. They, they hopefully will have some announcements here very soon. I'm very excited about the things that they're working on. Um, and uh, again, it, it, it's just providing more and great capability to, to the people around the world and, uh, and creating other opportunities for launch. <laughs> All right. Well, I, it, we're out of time here. I think that uh, ends our panel discussion. I hope uh, everyone enjoyed it. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come see the session today, and uh, uh, we really appreciate it. And have a great conference. Thank you.